This is Snarky Puzzle Answers 4, a dramatic reading by the stand-up physicist, available at science2.0.com. And I just basically started, started right into the puzzles. So here was the one I did on June 28th, Shoot It in the Head. Snarky Puzzle. If you go down in a gravity field. Time takes a little slower, rulers look a little longer, to somebody else. Not to you. Your, your rulers and, and clocks always are, are normal. It's just somebody else thinks something odd's happening with your stuff. Now that's two changes. Newton's scalar theory of gravity can only account for one. Duh. So write a four potential that could account for both G00 and GRR. If you don't want Newton to do all the heavy lifting, combine a metric with a potential. Since mixing of potential theory with dynamic metrics is blasphemy, expect to take a bullet from the, for the team. Here's the backstory. Newton's scalar theory of gravity is useful, but wrong. Some prefer to say, oh, the domain of uh, applicability this shiptimhood. The collection of conditions required to justify the situations where the equation happens to still remain useful, well, actually, that's just an extended dance version of useful. Since I am working to find the new, new thing, well, it's important for me to mark clearly that an expression cannot be the starting point for further growth. I get efforts from fringe physicists who start with Newton and then try to do a little bit better. Mm, you know, knocking down such work is like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, it's, it's just not uh, much of a challenge and it also isn't a lot of fun because I know how serious those people happen to be. Einstein's rank two field theory for gravity, general relativity, could end up being both useful and wrong. I recall once in a moderated news group, Psi Physics Research, having that a post with this formal possibility rejected because the moderator th thought of it as being overly speculative. Well, you know, moderators should have some history of science like good science theories get supplanted by better theories and then those old theories are wrong, right? We, we don't know yet how the universe got started and the leading hypothesis there is inflation. We don't know why stuff in thin disk galaxies can go at a constant velocity near the edge or why such a galaxy is, won't just collapse if you hit it down the center axis and the leading hypothesis there is dark matter. We don't know why current stuff seems to be accelerating more than in the past, and the leading hypothesis there is called dark energy. And we don't know um, how to quantize gravity, and the, the leading contenders there are work on strings and loop quantum gravity. The most brilliant physicists on the planet have tried to solve the general relativity quantum mechanics they don't want to party together problem. You think Einstein, Wheeler, Feynman, Weinberg, Hawking, failure, failure, failure. Now, why would that be? Hmm. Well, the most reasonable hypothesis explanation is that it can't be done. <laughs> Good, now I don't have to try and do it. So, uh, if a rank zero is simply too simple, and a rank two theory seems to be too complex, the Goldilocks approach is to try a rank one field theory. That is skipped in an otherwise really excellent uh, current uh, living, living Reviews article uh, on general rel tests of general relativity done by Clifford Will. Hmm. Why? Hmm. Well, you're going to have to actually wait a week uh, for my blog called Shoot a Shot in the Head.
as in it got hit. Uh, a darn solid reason to write off all of my claims, if you know this, this reason, which has to do with spin projection operators of a current coupling term. Well, <laughs> I, I guess I'm going to have to uh, do some work to explain that sort of thing. So now let's go to the answers. Okay, so here's the first answer. This is all 100% uh, potential. Okay, so you can see Newton's term in the first, and then you th see things that are awfully darn similar to that in that second term, only there's a little sign flip going on. All right. And, uh, oh, and the metric there was, was nice and flat. Nice and flat. Okay, and there is where you, you do the work of Newton in the first term uh, of the potential. And then your metric has a constant one in the first term because it doesn't want to do anything because it's all, all done by the potential. And then we've got these exponentials along the way that are going to end up with uh, very similar terms to the potential. If you think of the Taylor series. Okay, so people schooled in general relativity might give like this reflex rejection to that first equation because it's got a flat metric and therefore it's wrong, right? Well, recall the task at hand, which is just to be consistent with light bending around the sun experiments. Now, we already know that the very first term there was spot on exactly right for the time. And then there are no other terms in Newton's scalar theory uh, to get the space by part right. Now, with a rank one field theory, well, golly, they're new slots, and so they can get the job done. Those terms are the same size, they're just an opposite sign. You know, a four potential can do the work uh, for light bending around the sun experiments. Now, the monitor in, uh, in equation two, monitor is a, a fictitious character uh, involving a bull, uh, I think a bull and a man. Um, I guess a real bullshitter, right? But um, boom. Okay, um, you know it's part Newton, uh, part exponential metric. Uh, it's also going to probably get a uh, reflex rejection. And uh, you know where is the where is the elegance we've we've come to expect? All right, uh, it's kind of like uh, trying to get a, a, an erudite wine aficionado to try a single mile scotch. You know, sure, it'd be funny as hell to, to watch their eyes bug out, you know, uh, when they took a s serious, ser serious drink, you know, and try, try and convince them uh, that that was a really good, smooth burn. Um, well, you know, if I could get them through like a quarter of a bottle uh, through that single malt uh, thing, then uh, they would probably remain at the table because they couldn't walk straight anymore. And that's, that's when I'd start whispering. Duality, duality, duality. <laughs> because a potential theory can be dual to an exponential metric theory. So, let's drink up to duality. That should be elegant enough uh, for you fancy pants people. Hmm. All right. Well, on July 5, I had a, the blog, The Certainty and Uncertainty Principles. And I actually ended up asking two puzzle questions. Here it goes. Snarky puzzle. Where's my cowbell? I want more cowbell. People feel lost without their h-bar. Add it back to equation one. Discuss the silliness of this exercise. Bonus problem. Make the relationship between position and momentum operators complete. Figure out what is missing. The minus sign in the commutator should give you a big clue. When you add it back in, the greater than sign can be resigned to bad methods in education that will continue for years to come. The backstory. I recall John Baez uh, writing that if Planck's constant were to go to zero, then so would all of quantum mechanics. That idea really appealed to me. <laughs> it was so simple and direct. And yet when I calculated the commutator in a dimensionless way, poof, 
Planck's constant left the stage. Sorry, JB. Mm. Your piece of advice not did not stand the test of time. So uh, I, I actually thought the first question was a little bit on the silly side. And as I was like driving to work, I, I was wondering, you know, where the stuff in the uncertainty principle went on the, you know, on the other side when, when it's greater than sort of thing. I mean, there must be a precise home. And that's what uh, brought me to, to that, that question. Okay, so here is the answer to the, the first problem. And what we do basically is bring in an H bar uh, for the momentum operator, uh, which is great because then it has uh, units of momentum. And we carry that on through. And, um, and as you see, we end up with just H bar um, times, times the wave function. So that looks more like the standard sort of thing we're supposed to get in class. All right, but now for the where is the missing part? That's the that's the deeper kind of issue. Yeah, yeah, got caught there. And there it is. All right. So um, what do we got going on? We've got the commutator and an anti-commutator, something that's got all these positive signs in there. And as you can see, we end up with uh, twice uh, twice the fee thing. Uh, but we also have uh, the position times this derivative of uh, phi times uh, derivative of phi with respect to x. All right, so uh, when will there be like no anti-commutator or the uncertainty principle will be at its minimum? Well, either, if we look at this again, if x is like zero, oh, then we just, just get the phi thing or the wave function is not changing with respect to some spot in the manifold, say you're at a minimum or a maximum or an inflection point, then it'll again be all, all, all phi. And I don't know, that feels like a much deeper way to appreciate what's going on there. All right, on July 12th, I had the blog, Julian Barber versus Minkowski and I. Me? Somebody wrote me and said, you know, get this right. It's, and I forget, <laughs> Minkowski and me. Huh. All right, you know, I, I've got this buying that, you know, I flip the coin 50% uh, of the time and I more than 50% of the time I get it wrong. What's, what's wrong with the coin I use? I don't know. No matter what, the snarky puzzle asked that day was, imagine a pair of machines that can measure 10 to the 44th dimensionless time mm, to a high degree of accuracy. Uh, now that's a little over five seconds for you guys still clinging to the bosoms of uh, units. One is at sea level, the other at Mount Everest. Woohoo! Uh, up at least the base camp up at uh, uh, 5,380 uh, meters. So calculate the square of both of these intervals. Uh, and the formula for, you know, the, the fact that there are different heights is uh, delta t, the delta t equals the time you, that you're looking at it. Uh, this would be this 10 to the 44th times. Um, G m h over c squared r squared. So, um, and then imagine a bullet train traveling at uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 7. Rel that's a relative to the speed of light, okay? That actually, well, 10 to the minus 7 sounds small, but it's actually 200 miles an hour because light's so fast. Um, and um, they look at both of these clocks. You know, what would they report uh, for the interval? So the backstory is that I was kind of physics babbling back uh, at Christmas uh, 1988 when both my mother and my uh, sister brought me uh, Stephen Hawking's um, uh, Brief History of Time. And one of my ideas from that day was that all physics should be written in, in a dimensionless way. And it's kind of like working with the Reynolds numbers in fluid mechanics, but on steroids. And I finally realized how to actually implement um, that project so many decades later <laughs> and that is simply um, 
di divide everything, um, that make sure everything going in is dimensionless and everything coming out will also be dimensionless because everybody at the party is dimensionless. So um, take time in seconds. And if you divide that by the Planck time uh, in seconds, then you'll end up with a dimensionless number. Now, since Planck units are incredibly tiny, that makes uh, ordinary time huge, okay? Uh, derivatives with respect to either time or space are actually going to be like super tiny because they are actually the product with the, with the tiny Planck uh, time and uh, tiny Planck space respectively. So change doesn't happen uh, approximately, you know? <laughs> Oh, he does, but you know, in terms of the numbers, the, the, the dimensionless numbers is really weeny. So what made this assignment so fun for me was that I knew I was gonna feel really uncomfortable with the numbers getting plugged in. Uh, the numbers would feel like alien. Uh, well, too bad. <laughs> That's the way it sometimes goes in mathematical physics. All right, so uh, here, here are the equations and you know, this is way too small and too dense and all that kind of stuff. So you, you need to go to the blog and, and look these numbers up if you want to. But some of the, the crazy stuff is, of course, this time, about five seconds, having a dimensionless number of 10 to the 44th. Uh, the mass of the Earth is uh, considerably smaller than that. <laughs> considerably smaller than uh, five seconds. It's uh, 2.7 times uh, the 10 to the 32. Um, the height of Mount Everest, well, at least that's bigger um, than, than the mass of the Earth. <laughs> Don't quite get the logic of all this stuff. 3.3 uh, times 10 to the 38th, okay? Uh, so still smaller than 5 seconds. Uh, and then I figured out what R squared was, 1.5 times 10 to the 83rd. Uh, the delta T that comes out of this process is a minus 5.8 times 10 to the 31. Um, and uh, if you square the interval at sea level, you're going to get uh, 10 to the 88th, because uh, that's just 10 to the 44 times that factor of 2 in the exponent. And if you're on Everest, you're going to get the same 10 to the 88th minus a 3.5 like times 10 to the 63rd. And it's going to be hard to notice that. <laughs> 10 to the 63rd being what, uh, seven, no, it's a 25 orders of magnitude smaller. Hmm, that's, uh, that's pretty silly. So, uh, this delta, this time of, uh, this delta time that you get because one of these things is at sea level and the other is at Everest was uh, all of 10 to 31. And now that's, that's tiny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a half a picosecond. Um, and it surprised me uh, that a few dimensionless units of time are like larger than the mass of the Earth or the height of Eris. Uh, you know, so we will let our philosophically inclined uh, to reflect on that observation. So on uh, Je July 19, um, we had sex and the unified field theory R&D question. So here is the snarky puzzle. Think about animations of one zero zero zero. Now compare and contrast that to animations of zero point nine zero 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 and one point one zero zero zero. Reflect on the standard model symmetries in curved space time. So the backstory is that. Uh, something li that I like to call the standard model standard conspiracy. Now, I know people who work with the standard model like know this, but they don't talk about it. Or at least they don't talk about it to me. So, one thing I learned about computing, computer programming is that you should never really write in a constant by hand. You know, use your variables instead. I mean, nature's full of variables. And the standard model has these three groups, U1, SU2, and SU3. The S stands for special, huh. like it has a determinant of one. And the norm and the determinant of, of U1 is also equal to one. 
So to be pedantic here, what I, what I got here is I got the norms of all these things and they are equal to one with all of those zeros. I mean, that's a very special number, you know? You've got zeros going out from here to eternity. Now, the professionals whoa, 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 um, will just say that that is unitarity. Look it up on Wikipedia. You had to make sure that the probability works out to one. Exactly. Now, I embrace that my measurement of unity is like your measurement of unity. A central lesson of special relativity is that if I compare my sense of a number to your sense of a number, well, we can either agree because that number is Lorentz invariant, or we can disagree in a way that we can calculate because that is Lorentz covariant. Now, I suspect this unity here is, is actually um, invariant, doesn't change under a Lorentz transformation because it is a ratio. So uh, both the numerator and the denominator are going to end up changing uh, in the same fashion. It is my belief, and not really more than a belief because I can't back it up with the kind of rigorous uh, analysis required, uh, that gravity uh, may actually alter um, how one part of space-time views uh, in a manifold uh, looks at the unity of another uh, part of that same manifold. And so I've made animations of SU3 which contains subgroups uh, U, SU2 and, and U1. Now 50,000 quaternions were used to make these 25,000 elements of the group SU3. It's basically taking the norm a uh, normalized quaternion and multiplying by another quaternion. And, you know, where you just pick, pluck these uh, things out completely at, at random. Now, I should have used more to make the animation, um, you know, more continuous. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the time squared plus space squared always exactly equals one. Now, someone else in a different place in the gravity field would create an identical animation of their group. Now, if somebody were to be able to compare the three spheres that with, with, with different radii, well, then they would form this kind of dynamic uh, ice cream cone animation. Notice that this red sphere starts last and finishes first and has the smallest radius. Likewise, the yellow starts first ends last and has the largest radius. A larger norm means larger in time and space. So here's the actual animation of these, uh, you know, the 1, 0.91 1 and 1.1, uh, 1 .1, rather dull. <laughs> you can see they're just ever so slightly different, uh, but when we just take the norm, it's 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 a snoozer. Um, so what does gravity do vis-a-vis -vis the standard model? On numerical grounds, the experimentalists going through the inverse Fento barns of data do not have to be concerned uh, with my work. It is only folks worried about how gravity plays nicely with the other forces of nature that should be concerned. Gravity is a theory that must have a metric explanation, uh, a metric as in ruler uh, for time and space. Now, the earlier puzzle claimed that a four potential theory could be dual to a static exponential metric theory. So how big is that ball? As far as the person at the center of the ball, well, it's, it's always going to be unity because breaking unitarity, unitarity is not allowed. And it does not actually make much sense. I mean, in the, whatever happens, happens to happen on that sphere. When two of these probability beach balls are compared with each other, originating in different places in, in, in the space-time manifold, they can be different. That's at least how I view uh, the Pound and Rebka experiment uh, done down on Route 2 uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
uh, they put iron, uh, an atomic thing of iron in the basement, put another one uh, in the attic, and they beat their unitary drums at different rates. All right, so thank you very much, and see you in a bit. Mm -hmm.